call your attention to John chapter 15. <clears throat> John chapter 15. I want to read in your hearing verses 12 through 17. I'm only going to be able to deal with verses 12 and 13 today, but I want you to hear it as a unit so that you'll have it set in your minds. And I've said it before, the most important thing that I'll say today is what I'm about to read to you in your hearing. John chapter 15, um, verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, for all that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask in the Father's name, he may give it to you. Milton Boaz is a name I'm sure that you are not familiar with, but one that I hope that you will not soon forget. Milton was a uh, skilled uh, mechanic and an expert driver of tractor trailers. In one of his hauls uh, through a small city, he topped the hill and was immediately faced with a life or death decision. He topped the hill at a proper speed, but there was a bus full of children that had not yet exited the highway. And so as opposed to running into the bus or going into oncoming traffic, he made the decision to veer off the road and sacrifice his own life. We can't be sure what was going through Milton's mind during that time, but we can ascertain lessons from his actions. What we do know is he decided that it was better for him to die than for those children on that bus to die. In that moment, he thought of their lives as more valuable than his own. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. In the context of bearing fruit, Jesus says, you must abide in me, and you must necessarily bear fruit. One of those ways of bearing fruit is how you love one another. And Jesus makes no small effort to make sure that his disciples understood that point. He begins saying, I'm telling you this so that you will love one another. Verse 12 and verse 17 says, so that you would love one another. That's, that's the whole point, ladies and gentlemen, that we will love one another. Jesus says that you ought to abide. And if I were to outline the text, I'll give it to you very briefly here. Jesus says you ought to abide uh, because you are precious. Verses 12 and 13, Jesus talks in terms of his love for the disciples. Jesus says you ought to abide because you are my possession. Uh, verses 16 uh, helps us to understand that Jesus says 
uh, that, uh, well, actually not 16, verses 15, says that you are my slaves, that what happens in the context of abiding is you belong to me. And you and I will go over that uh, as time progresses on the word there, servant in your Bible is doulos, which is the word slave, and a slave is owned. Jesus says, you ought to abide in me because you are my possession. And then Jesus goes on to help us to understand in verse 16 that not only are we precious to him, and that we are his possession, but we're also picked by him. Jesus says, you do not choose me, but I chose you. So that when we come to this text, we understand necessarily, Jerry, that we ought to abide because we're loved. We ought to abide because we're slaves. We ought to abide because we are chosen. And so we need to examine in particular today this idea of being precious to Jesus. As we mentioned before, it is wonderful for us to declare our love for Jesus, but how wonderful it is to hear him declare his love for us. He says we are pride. We are treasured. We are his precious value treasure. That's who we are to him. God so loved the world that he gave his son. The Son so loved the world that he gave his life. And it is the Holy Spirit who presses this idea of love deep on our hearts. If I were to say it in a more succinct way, I would say, that it was the Father who declared his love for the world. It was the Son who demonstrated his love, and it is the Holy Spirit who distributes that love in the hearts of the believers. John 3.16 says, God loves the world. Um, John 15.13 says that Jesus demonstrated his love. And then, of course, in Romans 5, 5, the Bible says that the love of God is distributed. It is shed abroad in the hearts of the believer. While Milton's actions were admirable, they were not atoning. And we see uh, that axiomatic statement, greater love hath no man than this. But actually Jesus is speaking of himself to say that his dying for the world is a demonstration of his love. His death um, demonstrated his love so that his love for us is superior right, right. it is sacrificial and it is substitutionary so we, we, we got to look at Jesus's love because he tells us that we ought to love like he loved and so we understand from scripture there is no doubt about it that his love is superior it is a grand love. 
Our text says, Greater love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friends, but here Jesus is stupendous, superior love. In Romans 5, 8, Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. Amen. So that his love is superior in that not only does he die for friends, but he dies for enemies. That's a superior love. And then it is a sacrificial love. We hear John in his announcement in John 1, 29, Behold, the Lamb of God. Uh, this has sacrificial language attached to it. When he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This idea is of sacrifice. Jesus loves us so much that he would sacrifice himself. Then it is substitutionary. That is, he dies on our behalf. The Bible says in John 10, 11, Jesus says, I lay down my life for the sheep. Yeah. You must understand, brothers and sisters, that it should have been our death on the cross, but Christ died in our place. Yeah. And so Jesus exhibited a superior, sacrificial, substitutionary love. Then he says in verse 12, this is my commandment that you love even as I have loved. He says the love that you have seen me demonstrate he says I want you to emulate yeah. emulate C can I copy Jesus in his love yes the Bible goes so far in 1st John 3 16 1st John 3 16 that we know love because he laid down his life for us. And because he did, we should do likewise for the brother. Here, John, the disciple of love, calls our attention to the fact that our love for the brother gives evidence to our love for Jesus. You cannot say that you love God. Whom you've never seen. And do not love your brother. That you see every day. And so Jesus says the point of my love is that it is sacrificial. It's superior. Sacrificial and substitutionary. He commands that you and I love that way. That we love our brothers and our sisters. And let me say parenthetically here that uh, we demonstrate our love for God as we love our brothers. Uh, that the dignity of humanity is seen in the fact of the Imago Dei, that is to say, uh, that we are created in the image of God. Yeah. Every human in the world bears that image right. and necessitates that we love them. But beyond that, yes, the Bible calls us to a deeper, superior love. Right. Uh, we don't love like the world loves. But we love not just those who love us, but we're able to love our enemies. So he calls us to a superior, sacrificial, substitutionary love. First, to a superior love. The text says, greater love. 
greater love. That word greater there is the word from which we derive our word mega. Jesus says, I have a grander, mega love. Um, this love, obviously, is agape, and um, it is a love without emotion, without reciprocity, and without limit. Very quickly, uh, when I love, it has nothing to do with how I feel. Because it is a love of my decision, a love of my will. It is not based on reciprocity, what it is you can do for me. I don't love you so that you will love me back. The Holy Spirit uh, distributing that love in my heart creates a scenario where I can now love you, even if you don't love me back. And then, of course, it is a love without Limit. It's not the kind of love that comes and goes. And this is agape or agape, the love that Jesus loves us with. His love is superior and our love should supersede the love displayed by the world. The Bible says in John 13, 35, the world will know us by our love. This is our distinguishable quality that we love our brother. The greatest evangelistic tool is a transformed life. The way you live. And then the greatest example of that is of course how we treat one another. You remember 1 Corinthians 8, 13, the Bible says, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. The context there uh, is of a seasoned Christian who takes along with him a weak Christian, and they go over to an unbeliever's house. And while they're eating there, the weak Christian says, man, there's something funny about this meat. I believe he got this steak from the idol worship that I used to attend. Tastes just like it. And the question becomes, does the seasoned uh, Christian offend the unbeliever? Or does he offend the weak Christian. He can say, man, just eat the food. The steak is good. Let's go ahead with it and offend his brother. Or he can say to the host, listen, I'm glad you invited us here, but I don't think I'll eat any steak tonight. But most of us would definitely eat the steak. But the Bible says we love with a superior love. You should offend the unsaved person and protect the weak Christian. That's how we demonstrate our love. Listen now. Um, let, 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 let me say it colloquially this way. Uh, young lady, if you want to know how that man will treat you, look at how he treats his mama. The same thing goes for us in the church. The people on the outside are looking to see how they will be treated based on how you treat one another. And if you're in the streets running your brother's name through the mud, you are not giving a good witness to that person on the outside and they're thinking, why should I join the church when I can get all the juicy gossip out here? They treat people inside that way. Oh, I don't want to be a part of that. I, I get uh, more uh, camaraderie outside the church than I do inside. And so our love is a superior love. And, and uh, Paul says in Galatians 6.10, he says, So then, 
as you have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. But then he does not stop there. He says, especially to those who are of the household of faith. I say again, every human deserves your love and you should love them. But brothers and sisters, by gosh, people ought to be jealous by the way we love each other. Our love is a grander love, a superior love. Out there in the world, people are always thinking about revenge. When we come in here, we say that that belongs to the Lord and love covers a multitude of sin because our love is superior. I don't love the way people love in the world. I'm not trying to stab you in the back. I am watching you because I have a superior love.